So welcome to our virtual seminars on applied economics and policy analysis in Central Asia. My name is Bahram Merkasimov. I am, <clears throat> I will be moderating the session today. Uh, we're very honored and privileged to have our speaker, uh, Mr. Hans Holzucker, uh, Chief Economist at the Karak Institute based out of uh, Urumqi, China. So he will discuss today the COVID-19 and the economy challenges and prospects for Central Asia. Uh, briefly about our speaker today, he needs no introduction, but uh, so before joining the Carrick Institute, Hans was for two years lead economist for Central Asia with the EBRD, based in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Uh, he studied uh, sociology and economics at the University of Vienna and uh, has years of experience working uh, in Central Asia and outside. Uh, Hans's topic will be discussed by our own colleague, uh, Dr. Abek Yuldashev. Dr. Abek Yuldashev is our senior lecturer of economics at Westminster International University in Tashkent. So with that, Hans, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you, organizers, for having me. Thank you, everyone who dialed in and is, is looking. I'm actually, as it, as it is appropriate these days, I work from home and I'm Austrian, so I'm currently talking to you from Vienna, Austria. Uh, let me shortly give you an overview of what we are going uh, to discuss today. Uh, first, uh, I give a little bit of an overview about the uh, international uh, economic situation, showing the, the latest uh, data and, and the government reactions to the situation. Uh, then we will have perhaps a, a short break for, for questions. And, and a little bit of discussion. Then we move to Central Asia. And there uh, I will give uh, an overview over challenges, also forecasts. Uh, then a little bit discuss what are the most vulnerable parts of the population in Central Asia in this situation. Then talk a bit about the room of maneuver uh, to adopt measures by the governments in Central Asia uh, and then uh, discuss a little bit more in detail, not too much in detail, but a little bit more in detail, uh, the responses by the Central Asian countries. So let me start uh, with the international environment. Uh, not by surprise, we see a heavy slowdown from the latest data. So let me show you uh, the, the latest data here. Uh, this is about the swing in GDP, real GDP growth from the for first quarter of 2019 uh, to the first quarter of this year. So, uh, and the black line that you can see is the difference between the growth rate uh, last time and, and this time. And as you can see, so the, the, the pack is led by the, by the People's Republic of China. They switched from plus 6% growth uh, to minus 6.8% growth. Uh, so uh, really a heavy change. Uh, but as you can see from the chart, uh, there's basically uh, all the countries worldwide uh, uh, so a slowdown. Uh, the Central Asian countries uh, are still have still positive real GDP growth. You can see them in red and green. So we see Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyz Republic, Tajikistan, for Turkmenistan. Usually we don't have data. There are not very many data available for Turkmenistan. Uh, but as you can see, the Central Asian countries are still growing, however, at a lower pace. If, if we look 
uh, the data where we have uh, already also some April uh, readings, uh, like in the industrial production, again, the black line is, is the difference between uh, March and February on, on the left hand side and between March and April on the, on the right hand side. Uh, here, the, interestingly, the uh, Kyrgyz Republic has the, the sharpest slowdown. I, to be frank, I don't know what exactly this is. It's not gold, it's not Kumto. Without Kumto, it's even, even worse. And it's also extended uh, in April. So we have a sharp con contraction of industrial production. Uh, in, in the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, we have still growth in Tajikistan in industrial production and Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, but at a slower growth. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, in the Kyrgyz Republic, also in April, uh, we have a, a, a bit a big decline. Uh, going more to the con consumption side, uh, again uh, we see uh, most of the countries uh, less growth uh, than before. Uh, on the right hand side, before the, the dotted line, uh, you see the Pe People's Republic of China. Uh, there we have some recovery, however, uh, growth in retail sales uh, is still negative. And, and also in April, if, if you look uh, on the right hand side, again, the People's Republic of China, we have still a decline compared to a previous year uh, in, in retail sales. So consumers have not really come, come back. Uh, for the uh, for for the Central Asian countries, you can see a very sharp decline in April in in Kazakhstan. Uh, they have also a decline uh, in Uzbekistan. The Kyrgyz Republic, as opposed to industrial production, is still in in the in the positive uh, space. And uh, in April. Uh, retail sales were even a little bit growing year on year. So what to do with uh, such a, a situation where we have uh, a, a heavy contraction of economic activity all over the world, uh, governments and international financial institutions as well uh, took are going to take measures uh, to, to overcome this situation. And I quote here at the beginning of the crisis, uh, everyone was saying we will spend whatever it takes. And he, here I quote uh, Carmen Reinhardt, she's the new chief economist since a few weeks uh, of the World Bank. And, and a famous uh, scholar of studying economic crisis. So let's have a look what it means, whatever it takes. Uh, one of the, of the unprecedented measures uh, to ease uh, the economic situation is quantitative easing. So central banks, first they cut their policy rate and uh, the central banks of the major countries were buying at an unprecedented uh, qu quantity uh, government bonds and, and other bonds. So as we call it qu quantitative easing, uh, the People's Bank of China uh, also spent almost a trillion uh, dollars uh, for this purpose. So we have uh, strong easing of monetary policy in the main countries. Uh, we have uh, huge fiscal packages. Here are the, the 20 large G20 uh, countries, the big that you can see uh, fiscal packages uh, uh, go until 70, 35% of GDP in case of Germany, Italy, uh, United States, have a, a big GDP and nevertheless they spend 
uh, 10%, so it's uh, really unprecedented. Uh, however, not of all the spending is really uh, spending money r right now at the moment. Uh, what is called here below the line measures, uh, this is basically uh, expenditures which, the, which are not due right at the moment or which the governments uh, hope uh, to get back repaid loans and equity, which uh, then they would re reverse there and go out of the companies again. Uh, so the only the yellow, uh, the orange uh, bars are really re revenue and expenditure measures. Uh, also here's the uh, definitions. Uh, are not not always clear and things are moving still but what is clear is that is that these are really unprecedented uh, packages to prop up the economy uh, what kind of measures are adopted by countries by the major ones but also by the others uh, you see a, 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 the upper half of the uh, of this slide shows uh, expenditure measures and the lower part shows uh, revenue measures, so foregone revenue. So on the, on the expenditure side, you have something like energy subsidies, sectoral support, and so on. The most pop popular uh, are transfers uh, to firms and transfers to households, also wage subsidies. Uh, and on the revenue side, most of the countries uh, adopt some tax deferrals, both for, for firms as well as for households. The, the number is the, the numbers here written under is the percentage of countries which adopt such measures. Other measures in, include spending on healthcare equipment, state equity stakes. We had this already, like Tui Renault, Alitalia, Lufthansa are, are examples lose a regulation uh, of insolvency laws, employment retention support, uh, expanded access to short-term work subsidies, wage support, direct financial support, or, and uh, important, especially also for the Central Asian uh, region, direct uh, transfers, cash handouts uh, to households. Any questions at this point? Shall we discuss something or shall we go further to Central Asia? Uh, I see no questions in the chat box, so we can go forward. Can, can, I, can I ask a, a, a question, if I may? If I'm One allowed. question. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Thank you very much, I mean, for, for a very interesting uh, discussion on the international trends. And we see that, that the governments uh, have been very active in supporting their economies and the supply side. In your opinion, Professor, uh, how in general the governments were prepared for, for the crisis of uh, of the following type that we observe and in your opinion how well they were prepared how well they were balancing their support for the enterprises on the one hand with the support for the workers and their families on the other hand okay uh, let me be frank and answer the first question i don't think governments were very well prepared. Also in terms of the pandemics itself, I personally uh, came to Austria from on the 1st of February from China where there were really heavy controls and I was expecting I will be quarantined or something but no, no action at all. I just went to the city with, with, without any control with even anyone talking to me. So I don't think that time and also the WHO all that time has not declared a pandemic. So in, 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 in some way, I think the world was slow to, to react uh, uh, to the pandemic as such. 
uh, I'm in, in terms of uh, economic measures, I think, uh, well, there was some delay as well. However, I, I, uh, I'm still impressed what is possible under shock. So I think uh, the, the governments and also the international financial institutions reacted uh, quite fast. Uh, even so not being prepared. Maybe not, not everything uh, went well immediately. Uh, and actually early, early reaction, both like in economical terms as well as direct, directly to the pandemic was very important. There's some evidence that the countries who acted decisively early uh, fared much better in the pandemic as well as in the economy. Uh, so this is the answer to your first question. To your second questions, maybe we will discuss a bit later even more because it depends a, a little bit uh, on the kind of economy, what, what you should do. Also, also the mix of monetary and fiscal measures uh, depends a, a little bit on the situation. Like in, in countries which large parts of vulnerable uh, populations like uh, not very much of social protection, no unemployment benefits, no, no direct even channels to, to address them. Uh, probably a, a direct support to households uh, is the way to go, at least, at least in part. Uh, whereas in, in countries where maybe it's more important to keep the, the business going and if the business are going, uh, the social situation is not so bad, uh, you, you, you concentrate a little bit more uh, on, 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 the, on the company side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions or shall we go further? Yeah, I think uh, we can go further, Professor. We have some questions coming in, so I will read at the end. Okay, later, right? Yes. Okay, so let's talk about uh, Central Asia. Uh, this table here I borrowed from a larger one table uh, by the EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, my former bank. Uh, and it shows both kind of the channels uh, through which the, the crisis works, through which the crisis affects the countries, uh, as well uh, as how resilient these countries are to the specific shocks. And what you see for Central Asia, also not a big surprise, uh, Central Asia is, is affected severely by labor market shocks uh, and external shocks come in, uh, especially for the, for the commodity uh, exporters via the commodity prices and remittances are also uh, very important in uh, Central Asia and uh, resilience is, is not too high uh, to, to, to these challenges. So let's talk about uh, the, the challenges a bit more in detail. Uh, here can you see uh, the development of, of oil and gas prices. Uh, so obviously there is a huge uh, decline in, in both, uh, not only because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had a dispute between Saudi Arabia and Russia before, but the, but the crisis is prolonging uh, is keeping the prices low for a prolonged period of time. Uh, copper prices fell as well substantially. Uh, I put here in this chart also gold, in part because it was also mentioned in Uzbekistan that gold is hedging. Pakistan a bit ag against the, the, the drop in, in commodity in other commodity prices is a gold exporter also, but has a tendency in the case of safe 
uh, haven investment. So more de more demand for gold and gold the gold price is rising. So in, this is good for Uzbekistan and even more for the Kyrgyz Republic, which is a big gold exporter. Sharp decline in remittances uh, as well. You see, we go from 65 billion estimation to 47, 49 for 2020, 2021 for Europe and Central Asia. So uh, a, a sharp decline expected. And in, in the right hand table, you see how important uh, remittances are for the Kyrgyz Republic, Tajikistan. A bit less for Uzbekistan, but also important. So Kyrgyzstan is almost 30%, and Tajikistan, this is all, almost 30% of GDP, uh, depending on, on remittances. So, uh, so this is definitely uh, a, a big issue, beside, beside also the social issue of migrant workers coming home, not always easy. Uh, we all read about this in, in, in the news. Uh, so remittances and uh, labor migration is a, a big topic to discuss as well. Uh, next challenge, uh, as commodity prices fall and as remittances uh, fall, we have of course an impact uh, on the exchange rate and we see a depreciation uh, basically in, in all central uh, Asian exchange rate. Uh, the only exception is the official uh, rate in Turkmenistan, but I guess the par parallel market rate uh, has probably weakened as well. So what what, what does it what does this mean? Uh, I have here. Uh, for the forecast, for the prognosis, for the outlook, uh, I have here the, the forecast from uh, three major uh, inter international development partners, the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. Fund. Uh, let's concentrate uh, on the left-hand side, on the, the bluish table. This is just the average. Uh, of the forecast of all three. And as you can see, we go from 4.8% uh, in 2019 to just 1.5% growth uh, in 2020. And then we see a quite strong recovery uh, in, in 2021 to 5.1%. So what, what we see here in this forecast is a V-shaped uh, recovery. However, this comes with uh, several preconditions. And the, the one is, is that we are basically see now the peak of the pandemic. Uh, and, and the second one is also that, that we, there won't be uh, new waves of the pandemic. Uh, and also uh, all these organizations have uh, like a more worst scenarios. So this is the base scenarios. Uh, they have worst scenarios, down, downside scenarios, but they don't have upside scenarios. This is also a bit telling. And it depends, of course, on the measures taken and how fast actually uh, the, these measures are able uh, to prop up both demand as well as production. Sorry, I can't move my chart. Now it moves. Now know what happened. Uh, so uh, 
to give a little support of the idea of a V-shaped recovery. Uh, there you see again the difference, but this is the difference in sentiment in indicators. And as you can see in most countries, it's above zero. So it means most countries have in May become more optimistic compared to April, and including we have also data for Kazakhstan here. So also in Kazakhstan, optimism increased quite, quite a lot. So ho ho hopefully it comes like this. A, a bit of talk uh, about the most vulnerable parts of the, uh, of the population. Uh, we have actually not the best data situation uh, with regard uh, to this and the poor availability of data is actually an indicator uh, of the poor protection itself. So we have a definitely a problem uh, here. The, the black line is just a, that uh, the, the simpler average of all these uh, protection measures uh, announced here, like at least one protection, uh, pension, uh, some, some benefits for persons with disabilities, uh, unemployment uh, benefits, and, and uh, poverty. Uh, so, the, the worst here, look, un, unemployment benefits, uh, well, they look most problematic. And on top, I quote here uh, from, from Kas Pravda, uh, and you can see, I, I think, a large part of you is speaking Russian, so you can read that. Uh, and, and what it says that uh, the ministry, Minister of Social uh, affairs was saying uh, that uh, more than 4 million people uh, remained uh, without income the last two months. Uh, this, this is out of a population in Kazakhstan of 18 million. Uh, so, but if you look at the unemployment uh, figures, uh, uh, actually, the unemployment rate did not move a lot, neither in Kazakhstan nor in other Central a Asian uh, countries. So in Kazakhstan, unemployment is 4.8%, uh, very, very low and, and constant. Uh, so I guess there is uh, some problem uh, with recording the true, true unemployment, more or less all over the region, in part because of self-employed, uh, in part because people uh, go back to the villages, but, but there is some, some problems. Uh, a very important part also to be affected from the crisis uh, is small and medium enterprises and in low income countries, especially micro and uh, very small enterprises account for a large uh, part or a substantial part at least uh, of employment, and to some extent, this is the case also in Central Asia. Uh, poverty, uh, usually a high poverty ratio, usually coincides with low so social protection as well. We had this also before, uh, and you see uh, Uzbek that in Uzbekistan the rate is quite high, also in Turkmenistan, also in. Tajikistan. So uh, these are parts of the population which probably uh, need uh, special care during the crisis. L let me come to what countries actually are in a position to do. Uh, let's speak a, a bit about the fiscal and, and monetary uh, space the countries have to react. Uh, if you look first uh, at external debt, uh, so short-term external debt is not too bad uh, in the region. Uh, however, overall external debt is, is high. 
it, it's 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 in all the countries it's needed more than a full year uh, of export uh, to, to repay it. So the, the debt is, is quite high. Debt service in some uh, parts is also high. And what happens is that the weaker exchange rate, not only, and we saw before, all the exchange rate weaken. And this weaker exchange rate do not only fuel inflation, uh, but also increase the foreign debt service uh, in national currency terms. Uh, and if there are entities uh, which are not fully fully hedged by, by export proceeds or, or, or other measures, uh, this is quite a problem uh, for these companies. So, so far I know Uzbek Neftegas is among them. Uh, the international uh, reserves uh, are uh, quite substantial in the in the region. They look pretty good, except for Tajikistan, uh, and also uh, there are some funds. Uh, however, if the if low dollar inflows uh, because of low commodity prices and declining uh, remittances and money. Uh, outflows, uh, decelerated depreciations, countries could run into difficult uh, position. So this kind of limits the space of monetary easing. Uh, we, are, we are not like the, the, the Fed or the U European Central Bank or others or major central banks in a, in a position to print, print money. Uh, the Central Asia region uh, is dependent on dollars uh, from outside. Uh, so the, the, the space for monetary easing is uh, qu quite limited. And this is also in, in part an answer to the question uh, raised before, uh, what kind of mix uh, is preferable. Uh, general, uh, the, 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 the fiscal position of some Central Asian country is relatively fa favorable. Uh, so general government debt is rather low in the region uh, and Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan uh, possess uh, sovereign wealth funds. Uh, however, the drop in oil and gas prices strongly impacts the government revenues, both in Kazakhstan and in Tur Tur Turkish Turkmenistan, which of course uh, worsens the financial situation of these countries. And what I said of the relative favorable position applies only to three countries in the in the Kyrgyz Republic and in the in Tajikistan uh, government that is a problem. So what to do? Let's come to the responses by the Central Asian countries. And uh, the fiscal packages in the Central Asian uh, countries, I, I will not speak a, a lot about the monetary policy in the Central Asian countries. How, however, uh, central banks in uh, Central Asia also cut, in, cut interest rates. Uh, you, you will see that a little bit later. Uh, on the fiscal side, we have substantial uh, fiscal packages. Uh, again, definitions uh, vary and certainly these are only rough figures and the exact figures can be discussed. Uh, but as you see here, Kazakhstan, 9% of GDP, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan also roughly 2% uh, of GDP on measures. And uh, the Kyrgyz Republic has not so much so much up to now, but the Kyrgyz Republic uh, is getting money from the IMF and the Kyrgyz Republic will prepare a much larger uh, package as well. Uh, so in any case, it's clear that all these packages are of substantial size. This is a bit of an overview of what the countries in general do. So spending on healthcare and equipment and hospital capacity, all five uh, Central Asian countries 
have adopted uh, such measures, uh, special payments to healthcare workers as well, state loans and guarantees. Two of the countries have tax reductions and deferrals to the population for the population. Uh, three countries, uh, support for micro or small enterprises done by two countries, uh, public works to support employment just by Uzbekistan, financial uh, support for self-employed. Uh, this measure is adopted by three countries, expanding unemployment benefits, how precarious they are, are done by two countries, paid sick leave for the infected also by, by one country. Uh, three countries have adopted uh, cash handouts. Uh, two countries provided also food, a food safety net, safety net for the most vulnerable. And as I mentioned, Central Bank uh, cut two, in two countries, Central Bank uh, cut the policy rates. There is liquidity uh, support to banks in, in Kazakhstan. Uh, there is ex there's some changes in the regulation, so uh, loans, the, the repayment uh, periods for loans uh, have been extended and some other prudential requirements were also loosened. Uh, in Kazakhstan, there was intervention on the foreign exchange uh, market as well, uh, establishing in, in Uzbekistan, uh, a fund was uh, established uh, for where private don donors could contribute. Uh, and three of the countries here approached uh, international financial institutions uh, for help. And there is solidarity also within Central Asia. So uh, two of the countries uh, extended help within Central Asia. Also, there, there were, of course, also some problems like uh, uh, limitation of some food exports by some countries. Uh, I, this, uh, I will not run you through the, these two uh, slides there. If you're interested later, you can look up a bit more in detail uh, the, the measures adopted by the ind individual countries. So we have here all five countries, but I skip, I skip these two slides uh, and won't come uh, to, uh, to, to move actually to a discussion, more discussion uh, way of continuing. And so we see here a decree a presidential decree issued on the 18th of May uh, in Uzbekistan. So quite recently, uh, we, we speak about some of the measures uh, to be extended until September of uh, 2020. So there arises already the questions to what extent countries need to prolong measures change measures also in Kazakhstan, there's some discussion about uh, changing and prolonging uh, the measures a little bit. So maybe we, we can discuss later uh, where we stand here and how also other, other people think what needs to be done and uh, to what extent uh, measures need be extended or changed. Uh, we, I was talking here a lot about uh, the economy, but of course, not only the economy is important. Uh, the pandemic brings about uh, a, a lot of social issues, uh, not directly economic. Uh, among them, uh, for example, uh, uh, a, a worse, worse standing of women. In, in some areas, including also in households to some extent, and uh, domestic violence has, has increased. Uh, so this is not the topic here of our discussion, uh, the, 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 the social measures, but I wanted to mention that, of course, we are aware that not only pure economy matters. 
uh, let let me come to the to the discussion part here. I open it kind of. Uh, so I already started with these uh, questions. Uh, is it or already uh, time to relax uh, containment measures uh, like uh, closing schools, prohibiting big events and others? As you know, at least uh, in Central Asia, in part in, in Europe, uh, quite largely, uh, these measures are already relaxed. The question is, do you agree with it or sh should they be longer or maybe they ha haven't even be, shouldn't have been as long as they have been? So I would like to hear the opinion also of others. Uh, if it's right uh, to relax the measures, what people think or how we can discuss what is the li likelihood of a second wave of the pandemic and how long economic support programs therefore need to last. Uh, even if there is no second wave, how long might it take for the economy to recover and how much longer economic support programs need to last because of this reason? Will there be a V-shaped recovery? Which part of business and population should be targeted by support programs? Are direct transfer to the population better or is crediting business the better way? How big is the fiscal space in Central Asia uh, to go on with government support measures? To what extent monetary policy ca can be relaxed without causing uh, too much currency, currency depreciation and inflation? Uh, would more regional cooperation help or should better each country care for its own population? Uh, should international organizations such as the IMF and the World Bank be approached? Uh, I, to be honest, I have no answer to all of these questions. I gave some answers uh, to some of these uh, questions, uh, but keen to discuss. The even bigger question, which I did not address here, is what kind of future shall there be after COVID-19? You probably have heard there's a lot of talk about greening uh, the, the economy, uh, about digitalization and other things. So if someone has questions or ideas on this topic, I would also like to hear something of this or, or discuss something of this. Thank you very much. You are muted, but yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Halziker. A very, very interesting uh, discussion, and some of those questions you raised, I think, are food for thought for student viewers for their perhaps dissertation or uh, upcoming coursework. So. Uh, there are a couple of questions coming in, uh, more than five, but before we go to questions from the audience, I would like to ask our discussant, uh, Oybek Yildashev, to, uh, for up to five minutes to share his thoughts on the topic today. Please. Uh, Dr. Holzecker, thank you very much for a very detailed and interesting uh, video and presentation on <clears throat> the impact of, of COVID and the measures in the Central Asia to, to tackle it. Uh, in general, uh, it is very interesting and I think it provides a lot of elaboration about uh, what we observed today. A, a couple of observations that, uh, that I wanted to, to comment on. Specifically, these observations are on a certain slice and the data that has been used and whether these data that is provided here are uh, suspicious or not, if I may. Uh, if we will return, for instance, uh, to the data where we uh, reflect the amount of a working poor population, specifically the data for Uzbekistan seems a little bit strange, especially observing, uh, if we will hear. This one? No, uh, the, the one that is uh, prior to this one, the, uh, the the population working for less than one dollar and ninety nine cents. Uh, 
Yeah. Yes, that, that that's the one. Uh, um, well, first of all, I mean, it, it seems that a little bit higher than than uh, than expected uh, in, in general. But the second question is more interesting that. Uh, in your data specifically for Uzbekistan and uh, Turkmenistan, we observed that in general, there's more working poor across males than across females in Uzbekistan, which is a little bit suspicious. And how, how would you explain this type of observations? That's, that's the, 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 the first question. The second question is uh, associated with the V-shaped growth rates and the forecasts. Uh, if we may return uh, to, to the slides uh, that is uh, that was preceding this one, the recoveries. Just uh, let me see. Which was it? Uh, yeah, you mean this one? Uh, let me see. Yes, this one. Uh, uh, for instance, we, we observed that definitely there is going to be a slowdown due to the pandemic in 2020. But in most of the countries, we see a substantial growth rate to, to re the recovery is very high. I mean, how would you explain this type of recovery uh, in the economic growth rates? And what are the forces, in your opinion, of that behind that are going to give such a rise to the recovery in the consecutive year. And, and the last comment, uh, if I may, uh, the last comment is with the uh, foreign reserves and the uh, in terms of uh, imports. Basically, we would observe that the, that is uh, slide 20, 25, I think so. Slide 25, yeah. Uh, yes, this one. It seems that the figures are a little bit incorrect because uh, approximately in 2019, approximately the Uzbekistan foreign reserves were approximately 30 billion US dollars, whereas the imports were approximately 20. So in terms of months of imports, uh, this makes uh, Uzbekistan reserves uh, approximately 15 or 18 months. This is, these are the general comments. Of course, I had the additional questions, but I only have two or three minutes to ask. And uh, that's why um, I think I may join to, uh, if we have some time after our participants ask the questions, I will ask mine also. Thank you. Okay, so let's start with the first question, uh, which was about the, the poverty, right? And I, I, the, the only thing I can say is I was surprised as well <laughs> when when I saw when I saw the data. However, these are data uh, from from ILO, International Labour Organization, and I did not investigate what's wrong with them uh, but my but but my uh, first i also think they are wrong i mean this i don't think uh, female poverty is lower than male uh, but but the only what i can imagine and i was asking the question to myself as well uh, the only what i can imagine is this uh, that, that, that they would just ask about the the, the income and just the the man would answer. I, I think it's probably a question of not, uh, not, not even have a, a picture about what, what, how poor the, the women actually are. Uh, th this is my only, but usually in, in, in all other countries it's different. So I, I, had to, I had the same problem, but did not decide. Uh, I, I was thinking, shall I not show it? in order not to discuss it. But then I said, okay, let's show it. But I, I, I had the same problem as, as you have. Uh, on, the, uh, on, on the forecast, uh, I think 
first, as I mentioned, these are quite optimistic forecasts. And secondly, I think uh, to, to get uh, there is some dynamic. So, so if, if we start uh, to grow uh, in, the, in the second half of this year, next year we look quite high just because the first part of this year uh, was so low. So it does not mean uh, it, it looks better than it is actually. Yeah, it, it, it comes for a, comes from a quite uh, low basis. Uh, to, to to give you an example, for the People's Republic of China, if I remember correctly, uh, the IMF and also the others forecast for 2021 nine percent GDP growth. No one actually thinks this is like a sustainable. Uh, this, this is full output growth in China is is nine uh, percent. Even also the Chinese don't think so. So it's more like six. Uh, so I think this is in part just owed uh, to the dynamic quarter by quarter, and it will come down later again. So in the in the second part uh, of next year, it will be. Uh, lower than in the first part. And on your uh, third question on the on the reserves, uh, I have I have to admit first it's 2018 uh, data, and I just took him as it took them as it is uh, from the from the IMF again, I, I did not start uh, uh, to fill around with them. And I have to admit, I have not really checked for any uh, of, of these countries, but, uh, uh, and, and also it's not, it's, it's not just pure imports, it's imports of uh, goods and, and services. So it might be, a bit lower than if we just look uh, at goods, but uh, I, I believe uh, th th that the reserves in Uzbekistan, I believe you that they are higher. Uh, but anyway, I was saying basically in all the three countries, the reserves are quite solid. The only exception is Tajikistan. Um. Thank you. Thank you very much to our discussant, Oybek Yulgashev, and thanks uh, to Dr. Haldikov. So I will take a few questions from our viewers. Uh, there are some questions related to social safety nets and some more macro policies and the measures that were taken to respond by different governments. So let me, and we have uh, five to seven minutes left. So let me just ask, uh, combine those. And I hope viewers will, uh, will uh, let me ask uh, some of their questions. So the first question is, Dr. Halziker, so uh, from Kamujan Akramov, he writes, the evidence suggests that the distribution effects of COVID-19 are significant. In your estimate, how do they look like for Central Asian countries? Is there a need for changes in government social safety net policies? And related to this, uh, question on inequality. So, will inequality raise? Uh, will, will it be raised in these countries? And what policies might be proposed in this regard? And related to this, also the question about return migrants: whether it will increase unemployment rate is among the youth, and whether there was any assessment done, vulnerability assessment done by urban and rural livelihoods. The next set of questions are about the, so the, the measures taken to support the economy. So the first question is on this from uh, our viewer Bakhchan. He asks, um, in Kazakhstan, the proposal was to support airports and luxury real estate development, and that was criticized by the public. Should the measures target poor people or specific sectors of the economy? Uh, related to this, uh, by Hursana Usmanova, the question is, considering the wide range of measures 
taken by the government of Uzbekistan, what opportunities will it create for, for, the, for Uzbekistan on regional uh, basis as well as global levels? Will the position of Uzbekistan change anyhow in post-COVID-19 time? Uh, I guess uh, those are the questions and you can uh, briefly answer those. Okay, so let me start out with the question about inequality. Uh, I have not done any estimate how exactly uh, um, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, will, will change this. However, I, I'm pretty sure uh, th that this means it's particularly uh, the vulnerable part of the population uh, has become even more vulnerable, so more inequality. Uh, and as, as, as I mentioned before, I mean, de de definitely there is the need, uh, even without COVID-19, uh, to, do, to do more about uh, so social protection. Also, it's a bit difficult uh, to, to measure the inequality because what is usually done is to, to use the Gini coefficient, right, to measure uh, inequality, which, is, which, which compares like uh, the seals of uh, population, like for example, the, uh, the, the richest 10% with the poorest 10%. Uh, how, however, I think this is only, I mean, it gives some idea uh, however, actually, the, 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 the big issue is not the richest 10%, the big issue uh, is, is the richest 1%. Uh, so, and we don't have really numbers uh, on this. Uh, so, uh, to answer the question first, I think something needs to be done about the inequality. Yes, even without uh, COVID-19 uh, and uh, I, I think also COVID-19 uh, makes the, the, the question e even uh, more urgent uh, as many questions. Uh, many questions uh, which are raised by COVID-19 are not completely new things, but, but they look uh, sharper in the, in the situation of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, the second question. Oh, I wrote it down, but could you repeat just the, the second was which one? So the second question was about, uh, for example, on uh, distributional effects of COVID-19. Uh, if, uh, is there any need for changes in government social safety net policies? And, the how first effective, one. and how effective they are? And question was on return migrants and unemployment rates, but also vulnerability of rural and versus urban uh, populations. Okay, yes. So we were discussing during the presentation this or, or already a little bit. It it depends very much uh, on the on the on the situation, and uh, it brings me back also to this question about the airport, right? Uh, in Kazakhstan, so I, I don't have a direct opinion on the on the airport, uh, and I, I actually cannot really write a government program uh, on on these issues in detail. Uh, but, but I think in, for Kazakhstan, for example, I think you need uh, do kind of both. Yeah. Also. Uh, very important is to support the small and medium enterprises, uh, the National Chamber of Entrepreneurs, uh, for example, suggested uh, to change some of the money in, in, in other programs like the Roadmap for Employment, especially to credit more uh, small and medium enterprises because there are very important uh, for employment. So I think uh, you, you, you need to have kind of approach uh, on one hand, if needed, uh, uh, approach the systemic relevant enterprises to keep the economy going. Uh, 
to approach also the, the medium and small enterprises uh, and also to pay uh, direct subsidies to those uh, in need and how you mix these uh, things uh, depends a, a bit uh, how the situation is in the countries whether you have I don't know, in the Karak Institute, for example, we have also Pakistan uh, as a Karak country to look at. And there you have really uh, big numbers of daily workers, uh, which are even difficult to, uh, to reach. So there you definitely need large programs to support this kind of workers, for example. So I, I think there, there has to be a mixture and the government have governments have to come up with, with, with the best kind of mixture and all these uh, measures related to the specific situation in the country. Uh, so the third question was about the uh, uh, regional, uh, how would the COVID-19 uh, affect the regional importance of Uzbekistan? Uh, Again, I'm not, not sure this is a pure COVID-19 uh, question. I think first, generally, Uzbekistan is a, is a very important country uh, for cooperation and, and integration in the Central Asian region. Also because it's the largest, also, also because in, in terms of population, also because of the location and, uh, and the links to Tajikistan and, and such things. The, the, this is structural. On top, uh, the opening up policies of Uzbekistan, of course, open uh, new opportunities to increase the weight of Uzbekistan, not only in the region. I think that the question is not only about uh, to be, to increase the weight in the region, the, 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 the target is to increase the weight of the region globally by, by uh, advancing integration and cooperation processes in the region. And I think Uzbekistan also because of the internal reforms and also because of the better prospects now to attract foreign capital, uh, overseas capital among others. Uh, because of all this, I think Uzbekistan has really a crucial, very crucial uh, position uh, in, in these processes and a very crucial uh, role to play. And actually Uzbekistan uh, started to play uh, such a role even before uh, COVID-19 by organizing uh, big meetings on, on the regional, Central Asian uh, regional level. Okay, on this positive note, uh, we're out of time. So I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Halziker for this very interesting and, uh, and uh, stimulating discussion. Thank you to our discussant, Arbek Yildashev. Thank you to our viewers uh, for joining us today. And all of the presentation materials, video and slides will be uploaded to our website. Uh, this webinar was delivered and organized to you by Westminster International University, IFPRI, and IAMA. So thanks to all the organizers. And please join us next time on Wednesdays at 4.30 p.m. by Tashkin time to listen in to Katrina Kosek uh, with her topic on the effects of income fluctuations on rural health and nutrition. So thank you to everyone and see you next Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.